Beyond UC, UCC, The Essentials of Statutory Lien Searches. My name is Anu Shaw and I will be your moderator. Joining us today is Paul Hodenfield. Paul is Associate General Counsel for Corporation Service Company and serves as the company's subject matter resource for UCC, real estate, and other transactional service matters. He is a frequent speaker and writer on UCC search and filing issues and is a 2013 recipient of a National Association of Secretaries of State Medallion Award. And with that, let's welcome Paul. Thank you, Anu. Um, yeah, in my role at CSC, I respond to a lot of questions both internally and externally um, regarding the services we provide. And a lot of these questions actually uh, concern statutory liens. So that's why I've put together this program. I mean, most lenders and legal professionals know how to conduct an effective UCC search. I mean, that's the bread and butter of commercial uh, transactions, due diligence. However, due diligence for many types of commercial transactions often requires additional searches for statutory liens, such as tax liens, judgment liens, or adverse interests against uh, either the real or the personal property of the debtor. Now, searches for statutory liens can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, there is a tendency by searchers to impute UCC rules to statutory lien searches. And that's really not surprising because some types of statutory liens may be commingled in the UCC index and even filed on UCC forms. However, assuming that the UCC rules always apply to statutory liens can be a costly mistake. Different rules typically apply to statutory liens. The requirements for filing location, sufficiency of the record, attachment, and priority may not be governed by Article 9, even when the lien is filed on a UCC form. So what I intend to do with this program today is to provide some background on the most common types of statutory liens that are searched as part of the due diligence process and offer some best practice suggestions uh, for producing the most reliable search results. Now, much of my focus today will be on statutory liens against personal property, but I will spend some time on searches for tax and judgment liens that apply to real property as well. And at the end of the, pre uh, at the, end of the presentation, I'll uh, try and leave some time for uh, questions. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to just go over some background information about statutory liens. Then I'll move on and talk about some specific types of statutory liens, uh, spend some time on tax liens, judgment liens, other types of federal liens, and then uh, state statutory liens. Um, I'll begin, I guess, uh, with a, a brief introduction into statutory liens. Um, throughout the presentation as well, I may at times compare and contrast a little bit the statutory lien search practices and, and uh, nature of the liens with the UCC uh, just to uh, highlight the differences, but uh, the focus will be on the statutory lien uh, search best practices. Uh, I guess the place to really begin is with the, the simple question, what is a statutory lien? A statutory lien is any lien that arises by operation of law without the consent of the lien debtor. In other words, when certain, um, uh, certain criteria are satisfied, the lien springs into existence. Uh, this is opposed to a UCC security interest, which is really a voluntary or consensual uh, interest in uh, property. Uh, the uh, statutory lien is a non-consensual. The debtor doesn't agree to it. It just happens because the debtor um, uh, either did or didn't do something that resulted in uh, a liability, an obligation that is secured by a statutory lien. Uh, the filing location for statutory liens is going to be determined almost exclusively by the, stat the law under which the lien was created, not by some other uh, law. Uh, although there are exceptions, of course, but uh, the filing location for some statutory liens may be with a secretary of state, it may be with a county recorder, it uh, may be with both, and it may be with some other office within a, a particular state. But that's going to be defined by the statute that created the lien. The, likewise, the perfection requirements for the lien will be determined by the statute under which the lien arises. 
so the statute is going to say what a lien claimant has to do to get to perfect its interest and get priority against the debtor's assets. In some cases, however, statutory liens actually fall within the scope of Article 9. This is primarily with agricultural liens, and I'll spend some more time on that later. When it comes to determining priority, um, it's, uh, again, uh, if the statute under which the lien arises specifies a, a priority for the lien that's different from the normal priority rules, um, that's typically what will apply. And uh, that, that, in other words, the UCC priority rules may or may not apply to a statutory lien. In fact, some liens even have a super priority, even over prior recorded or filed security interests in the same collateral. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later as well. Once uh, a statutory lien is created, the duration and effectiveness of the lien, again, is determined by the statute under the under which the lien arises, and uh, there is a wide range in how long these liens can be effective for. It depends on the type of lien and the, uh, 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 you know, the the uh, whether it's state or federal lien and things like that. Now, when it comes to searching for statutory liens, one thing that's important to remember is not all types of statutory liens require a public record filing, and consequently, there are certain types of liens that cannot be searched. Um, there's just no way around it, and uh, but most of them can. That's uh, that's the important thing to take away. Most types of statutory liens can be searched and can be identified. So with those basics out of the way, I want to move on and talk about uh, tax liens. And I'll start with federal tax liens because these are the most commonly searched uh, statutory lien out there. Uh, actually, any type of tax lien is a, a very important record and. Uh, it's a good idea to search for these things for many types of commercial transactions for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the, a lien in favor of the IR, IRS can frequently take priority, especially after, uh, uh, especially with after acquired collateral, and uh, also uh, tax liens, be they, they state or federal, tend to be the only public record leading indicator of financial issues. They, aren't, they don't always indicate financial issues, but what tends to happen is if a small business starts running into cash flow problems, uh, the first thing that they tend to stop paying are their taxes. Being the eternal optimist, they tend to think, well, we'll make it up fairly quickly and uh, get, those, get the taxes caught up, and uh, you know, then we won't have to you know, worry about suppliers cutting us off or not paying employees and winding up in trouble there. So. Uh, they will sometimes stop paying their taxes because that's the uh, that has the least immediate consequence sometimes. So it it can be an indicator, not always, but it can be an indicator of uh, you know, potential uh, financial issues. Now, when it comes to federal tax liens, uh, federal tax liens arise under the federal tax code in favor of the IRS. Um, uh, like any statutory lien, all that's required is that the statutory conditions be satisfied, and the statutory condition under for federal taxes is the taxpayer didn't pay what they owed. As soon as it's not paid, the uh, lien exists. But to get priority versus other recorded and filed interests against the debtor's personal and real property, the IRS has to go an extra step, and that is to file a notice of lien. Uh, so that will that will cement their, the IRS's priority um, it, as a general rule. Uh, prior perfected security interests and liens will take priority over a later filed tax lien, but um, there are some exceptions to that. The uh, priority of the federal tax lien is established at the time the notice is filed, but it may take priority over after acquired collateral or um, uh, advances made by the uh, by a, a secured party uh, more than 45 days after the notice was filed. So this is a particular interest to factors and other asset-based lenders that are making uh, uh, regular advances. If they aren't aware of the tax lien, they can be making advances that are unsecured or at least unperfected. They're subordinate priority to the uh, to the IRS lien. Consequently, some uh, some companies will go ahead.
ahead and run a tax lien search every 30 to 45 days uh, to try and catch a tax lien before they make uh, future advances. Now, um, once it's filed, a federal tax lien is effective for 10 years. It can be refiled to continue that effectiveness for additional 10-year periods. Uh, this is what a notice of federal tax lien looks like. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. It provides the name of the uh, taxpayer, uh, provides a list of the uh, uh, tax liability, the assessments, and uh, you know where they're behind. Uh, it provides contact information, somebody in the IRS that people can contact with questions and things about the tax lien. Fairly straightforward notice. Uh, the, for searching purposes, in order to correctly search for federal tax liens, it's important to know where they're filed. And there are filing rules under federal law that the IRS has to follow. Uh, and it's based upon the type of property, or at least the first step of the process is based upon the type of property. Uh, if it's real property, then the federal tax code states that the filing location for a notice of federal tax lien is the one office within uh, the state in which the property subject to the lien is situated. If it is uh, against personal property, the filing location under federal law is the one office designated by the law of the state in which the personal property subject to the lien is situated um, for personal property. So both of these actually look to state law for which one office within the state is the proper office in which to file. So uh, the states actually have all enacted, uh, with one exception, uh, statutes that designate where federal liens are filed. If the state does not have such a statute, um, then federal law has a default rule, and it says it's the office of the clerk of the U.S. District Court for the judicial district in which the property subject to the lien is situated. Um, in practice, this only applies to Massachusetts right now. Uh, Massachusetts has not enacted the uh, uh, a designation for, for where to file federal liens, so it's with the federal district court, and that means that's where they're searched. Uh, it almost wound up being that way in Kentucky. There was a, a bill a couple of years ago in Kentucky that would have required dual filing of federal tax liens on personal property with the county and with the Secretary of State. And when the IRS uh, caught wind of that, they said, well, if you enact this law, we're not going to file either place because you have not designated one office within the state, as, uh, as mentioned in the federal law. Therefore, we are going to start filing in the U.S. District Court. And uh, that was enough to, uh, to derail the dual filing uh, concept for federal liens in, in Kentucky. And that provision was taken out of the bill. Now, the key to determining where to file uh, or where to search you know, for the IRS, where to file, is going to be based on the location of the property. Now, the location of the property is not always intuitive under the federal tax code, um, and, and it is addressed under the federal tax code. First of all, for real property, it's situated at its physical location. That's easy enough to determine. I mean, real property doesn't get up and move around. If it's in uh, you know, Cook County, Illinois, it's in Cook County, Illinois. It's not going anywhere else. So it's situated in Cook County, Illinois. If it um, is situated, or if it's personal property, then the rule gets a little more complex. Uh, personal property under the federal tax code is deemed located at the taxpayer's residence, whether it's tangible or intangible. So it could be a uh, bulldozer in California, but if the taxpayer's residence is in New York, New York is the place to file that federal tax lien. Note that the taxpayer's residence may be different than the location of the debtor for purposes of the UCC. You can have a registered organization formed under the law of Delaware with its headquarters in um, New York and its collateral or its uh, um, equipment out in California, well, it's not located in Delaware for federal tax lien purposes like it would be if it was a, a UCC. The taxpayer's residence, of course, it's easy enough to determine what the residence of an individual is in most cases, but if it's a corporation, partnership, that type of thing, it's located at its principal executive office. 
So if we have that situation where you have a Delaware corporation headquarters, its principal executive office in New York, and its bulldozer out in California, uh, notice federal tax lien to cover that bulldozer is going to get filed in New York, not Delaware or California. So the, um, that's where the rules get a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but uh, the tax code mentions corporation or partnership. Um, uh, partnerships, uh, the, the IRS typically treats an LLC as a corporation or a partnership. Uh, consequently, uh, this would uh, typically apply in those situations. Uh, and again, bear in mind that this is a different rule than is, uh, uh, applies to the location of filing for UCC purposes. So you search at the taxpayer's residence, which in the case of a business, is the um, uh, principal executive office. There is an exception to this rule, though, and that is if the taxpayer is located outside of the United States, then they are deemed to be located in the District of Columbia. So it would be filed in DC. Now, the federal law points to state law for where within the state to file. Uh, the states use different criteria for doing that. Um, there is just, again, that one office. Uh, most states have enacted what is called the Uniform Federal Lien Registration Act to designate the office within the state. Uh, it is a uniform act, uh, and it has been adopted by over 30 states. However, uh, like any uniform act adopted by the states, each state is free to tinker with it a little bit, so there are non-uniform enactments. Uh, they, they may use different criteria for determining where to file. But 30-some states base their uh, Federal Lien Registration Act on, uh, uh, on the Uniform Act. And they, again, they may use different criteria to decide where things are filed. They may determine, first of all, based on what kind of property it is. Of course, real property is typically designated to be the county recorder or, or other real estate uh, records official. Uh, for personal property, it might depend on whether the taxpayer is a corporation or an individual, whether they're an entity or an individual. And uh, that, may, uh, that may result in a different office within the state. So federal liens on real property pretty much always designate the county recorder, register of deeds, or equivalent real estate office. Personal property may be filed at the state level or the local level, depending on the type of debtor. Here is an example of uh, a, a state federal lien filing statute. And this is one based on the uniform federal lien statute. Under this provision, this is Illinois, notices of liens on real property uh, are to be filed in the recorder, the, the recorder of the county where the real estate subject to the lien is situated. So the IRS would have to file in each county within Illinois where uh, to, to attach to specific real property. Uh, so if there's real property in three different counties in Illinois, the IRS has to file uh, against each property in the, in the county. Uh, so they file in three different counties. For notices of federal tax liens on personal property, however, um, the rule is a bit different. Um, there, it depends on the type of the debtor. If the person is a uh, corporation or partnership, then um, the filing location is the Secretary of State. Some states include limited liability company within that text, so it's clear that it applies to an LLC. Um, if, the, if it's a trust or if it's a, the estate of a decedent, it's also the Secretary of State. And then in all other cases, in the office of the recorder of the county where the uh, person against whose interest uh, resides or against whose interest the lien applies resides at the time at the time of the filing of the notice of the lien. So that's pretty much for individuals. So they're going to get filed at the local level. Now the states have different models for how they index federal tax liens, especially on personal property. Um, in some states, they file them at the state level, or at least the the federal liens that are filed at the state level are commingled in the state UCC index. So they're searched using the UCC search logic, which can create some uh, challenges. Um, and the reason why it does is because the IRS doesn't have to comply with Article 9 debtor name requirements. And in fact, they, they rarely do. 
Um, some states, it's a minority rule, but there are a few states that designate filing, say, with the Secretary of State, but the Secretary of State maintains a separate federal lien index. Uh, they might commingle them with statutory state liens, too. But there are three states that maintain a separate index at the state level, so you have to search UCC and tax liens using different systems. And then there are some states that have uh, uh, local filing only. Everything goes to the county recorder who maintain, or, or a county clerk or something like that who maintains a separate index. And there are different, uh, so that are, there are different roadmaps depending on the type of state and the structure they have in their uh, federal tax lien filing statute. Here's a, an example of how that works. Um, this, this is based on the, um, the, the uniform federal lien statute uh, at, and similar to what's, what I showed you for Illinois. Uh, the first step is to determine what state's law applies. Once you've determined uh, the state where the law applies, then it's necessary to look at whether it's real property or personal property. And under that Illinois example, which again pretty much mirrors the uniform text of that act, uh, the place to search for real property, uh, federal tax liens, is in the county recorder. Uh, in some states, it would be the county clerk or register of deeds, whatever they call them. If it's for personal property, then we have to make an additional inquiry as to the nature of the debtor. If the debtor is an entity, again, corporation, partnership, uh, trust, and so forth, it goes to the Secretary of State. If it's an individual, we're back to the county recorder for the federal lien index. But that's not the only type of structure that's out there. Uh, another example, you start it the same way, but um, many states do designate all federal tax liens to be filed locally. So you've got your real property, that goes to the county recorder again, but all personal property notices of federal tax lien go to the county recorder. So all searches have to be done at the county level. And then finally, there are uh, some states that designate it just strictly by the type of property. So real property and personal property. Personal pro property going to the Secretary of State, real property going to the county recorder, it doesn't matter what the type of debtor is. So when searching for federal tax liens, best practices start by identifying the type of property involved and then determining the residence of the taxpayer to be able to know, um, you know what in, th that's the preliminary information that you need to know in order to uh, determine where within the state it needs to be filed then consult the state law to determine the correct filing office. Um, and then um, be sure when you're searching for tax liens, because the IRS, again, doesn't have to play by the debtor name rules for Article 9, search for name variations, because secured parties can and have uh, you know, lost uh, priority to the IRS, because the IRS doesn't have to play by those rules. and. Uh, uh, their lien didn't show up using UCC search logic because it didn't disclose name variations. And the most famous case there is from about 10 years ago, that spearing tool of manufacturing where uh, the lender uh, had a perfected security interest in all the debtor's assets. They, di they did regular tax lien searches, but they were doing it using the jurisdiction's standard UCC search pickup, much in the line of name variations. The IRS filed under a name variation court held that the IRS didn't have to comply with the UCC debtor name rules. All it had to do was uh, you know, comply with its own rules, which it did, and therefore the IRS wins. Now for state tax liens, um, again the property type is sometimes going to determine where it's going to be filed. Uh, if it's uh, real estate that's to be covered by the state tax lien, it typically requires filing in the real estate records. There are some states, however, that treat tax liens, state tax liens, uh, more akin to a type of judgment lien, and they have them recorded in the judgment docket, where it is treated much like a judgment lien, although there may be some differences. Uh, for personal property, um, sometimes they file in a state central index, but sometimes state tax liens are filed at the county. It all will de depend on state law. So uh, it's always necessary to consult uh, you know, the state law to determine the best place. Also, the debtor type it can be uh, a factor. If it's an individual, I think the majority rule is that state tax liens on individuals get filed at the county level. 
and uh, for organizations more commonly at the central state level index uh, rather than at the county, but there are many states that do file everything at the county when it comes to a state tax lien. In fact, the state tax lien filing locations uh, can be very different than for federal tax liens in the same state. Uh, there is no necessary connection between the federal lien statute and the state lien statute. And as I said, some states treat tax liens as judgments. Um, and so what will happen is uh, state law may provide that a warrant for the tax or a notice may be docketed uh, in, the, in the courts, and then it can be enforced as a judgment. However, uh, judgment liens of this type may have different uh, effects than a judgment lien arising from a, a money judgment from a civil action. Um, and one example is in Washington where uh, the, the state tax lien law says that uh, when it's uh, docketed, it becomes a lien on all the real and personal property of the taxpayer. But a judgment lien in the same state only attaches to real property, even though they're treated the same way. So when it comes to the best practices for searching state tax liens, um, determine, first of all, what kind of property is involved, then determine the type of debtor, and then review the state tax lien statutes to determine where records affecting the property and debtor um, would be filed, depending on how the state law is structured. And then be sure to search the appropriate index. That may require searching not at the county recorder, but rather in a judgment docket index or something along that line. And it's possible it could even be, it could even require a search at a city or town level, especially with some of the eastern states uh, where they have independent cities. This is what a notice of stat, state tax lien might look like. They uh, differ widely from state to state. This is a California state tax lien. This one happens to look a lot like a federal tax lien. And in California, state tax liens uh, uh, are often filed with the Secretary of State. And as a result, it's uh, filed much the same way that a federal tax lien would be. Um, and again, the form looks very similar. But there's no uh, reason why a state tax lien has to look like a federal tax lien. And the forms may be very different in other states. Now I want to move on and talk about judgment liens as a threshold issue. Um, I want to draw a distinction between a judgment and a judgment lien. There is an important distinction. A judgment is a final order issued by a court. It may be for money. It may say, uh, plaintiff, uh, you know, you, you are awarded uh, $1 million from defendant. Defendant is now obligated to pay that $1 million. But that's just the judgment. That's just an order. That is not a lien in most states. In uh, the majority rule is that the judgment creditor is going to have to take some sort of additional action to perfect its lien and make it uh, enforceable. Um, judgment liens typically have somewhat limited scope, too. The majority rule out there is that uh, it only applies to real property once it's docketed or filed. Uh, enforcement against personal property of a judgment lien in most states uh, the lien either doesn't exist or can't be enforced except by levy and execution. In other words, the sheriff's got to go out and, and grab that uh, personal property. So uh, the judgment lien doesn't necessarily attach to personal property. Of course, uh, it depends on state law. As far as the duration of judgment liens, it's not uniform. It varies widely from state to state. It can range, um, it can range anywhere from 5 to 25 years. Uh, depending on the state law. Uh, some types of actions result in longer judgments. Child support liens, for example, uh, a, right, or a judgment that creates a uh, child support order, the lien may be a, uh, a longer duration than other judgment liens in the state. Um, the laws of most states do permit some way of continuing the lien for an additional period. Um, it might be by refiling. Uh, or uh, obtaining a, an extension from the court, something along that line. It varies widely from state to state. When it comes to judgment liens on real property, most states require that the judgment creditor uh, take an action to perfect that lien on real property. Uh, typically, that's going to be docketing the lien with, with the uh, court clerk or wherever the docket lien or the lien docket or uh, judgment docket is maintained for the court. 
And uh, typically what happens then is uh, uh, it becomes the lien. Now, in some states, the court clerk automatically dockets it, so no action is required, but I think those are in the majority. Now, once it's docketed or filed as uh, required by the uh, state law, typically the rules of civil procedure, then the lien becomes, or the judgment becomes a lien on all of the debtor's real property located within that county and only that county. There are some exceptions to that for real property, but for the most part, it's only the county where the uh, lien is docketed or recorded. Now, there are, uh, under the laws of some states, that may, might not be enough to reach all real property of the debtor within the county because there is a type of property, it's sometimes called Torrens property or registered land. This is land that has been, um, been through an, a, a judicial process and is now subject not to the abstract system for determining uh, ownership and, and uh, encumbrances of real property, but rather a certificate of title is issued for the property, and uh, no encumbrance or interest is uh, effective until it's been noted on the certificate of title. So in that type of case in those states, and I know Minnesota is one of these, um, in order to make it effective against a uh, uh, titled property like that, it has to be noted on the certificate of title. So uh, docketing the judgment in the county will cover all the debtor's non-registered property, and then the, the uh, creditor will have to also have it indicated on the certificate of title for any, um, any property that's registered or in the uh, Torrens system. Uh, the lien does not attach to real property in any other county or other jurisdiction in, in most cases unless the creditor takes some additional steps, and that, that will mean they have to take and docket the judgment in any county where the debtor owns real property in order to get at that real property. And if it's in a different state, the state, state laws do allow for uh, docketing of foreign judgments. Um, that's typically found in the rules of civil procedure. And uh, once it's docketed, it will become a lien uh, within that state, or once, it, once the, the um, uh, statutory requirements are satisfied. It'll become a lien within that state. Now, the rules are very different for personal property, however. Um, in most states, a judgment lien doesn't attach. It, do, it, it might not even exist in many cases against personal property. It may only um, allow somebody to execute on that property. So. Uh, uh, the majority rule is that the only way to enforce a judgment lien against personal property is through levy and execution. There's nothing that can be searched other than the judgment docket or wherever judgments, uh, judgment liens are created, because once it's there, then somebody knows that personal property could be levied upon. Um, there are a few states, not a lot, but there are a few states that do allow perfection of a judgment lien on personal property through the filing of a lien notice or UCC form with the Secretary of State. Uh, 45 states pretty much follow the majority rule. There are five states that allow perfection of a judgment lien on personal property by filing a notice or financing statement. So when it comes to searching for judgment liens, the best practice is search for judgment liens on real property in any county where the debtor owns real property because they will have to be, uh, in most states, they will have to have been um, located there. Although check the state law, because there may be a couple of states out there that provide for statewide coverage for judgment liens, especially if they have a, uh, you know, the counties all linked together in a central judgment lien index. But uh, typically it's going to require searching in the county where the real property is located. And if it, is in, if it is registered land in a state where the law allows registered land or Torrens land, then it might also be necessary to look at the certificate of title. For personal property, there really isn't anything that can be searched to identify a lien, um, but the judgment docket, the same place you'd search for a judgment lien on real property, can be searched and identify when a judgment lien has been created that could lead to levy and execution against personal property. And in those states that do allow central filing of uh, judgment liens, um, you know, again, California and the like, uh, it's a good idea to conduct a UCC or a, a, a state judgment search. 
It's actually just a UCC search because they're filed typically in compliance with Article 9. So again, uh, judgment liens. Now on to some other types of federal liens. Two most common other federal liens that uh, we're asked to search are ARISA liens and environmental liens. An ARISA lien arises under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which has the acronym ARISA, and uh, consequently the name of that lien. It's also called a Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation lien. Um, it's a lien in favor of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation uh, for unpaid uh, uh, pension obligations by a company because the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation does guarantee pension benefits and uh, if, a, if the pension's underfunded or company fails to make the required uh, uh, contributions, uh, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation gets a lien. And that lien remains attached to all of the debtor's real and personal property until it's paid in full or becomes uncollectible. So it's uh, uh, quite a long duration for the lien. Now the filing location for these liens is uh, determined by federal tax lien law. The ERISA statute points to federal tax lien law and says you file uh, these things in compliance with the federal tax lien law. Uh, and as a result, uh, these federal liens are filed just like a tax lien in the same location. Uh, the thing that they will have different is a form. There is a, it, the form looks similar to a federal tax lien, but it's a little bit different. Uh, this is what a, uh, uh, an ERISA lien looks like. It's titled the, uh, federal, or the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. That's the entity in whose favor this lien arises. And, uh, they, they do look a little bit different from a federal tax lien, but they're, they're very similar and they are filed the same way in the same location and searched the same way. Environmental liens arise under the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA. And so it's sometimes called a CERCLA lien, it's also called a Superfund lien. And uh, it provides a lien in favor of the government for the cleanup costs and other damages related to uh, pollution. It's uh, a lien in favor of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Uh, they're the ones that uh, enforce this to recover collection costs. Uh, the lien attaches to all the debtor's real property and related rights. And uh, again, it remains in effect until uh, paid or becomes uncollectible. Uh, again, the uh, CERCLA law points to federal tax lien law for filing location, so it's filed the same way that a federal tax lien would be filed on real property in the same jurisdiction in the uh, same manner. Um, the lien form, though, is a bit different because there is no form. Uh, the EPA did, has not approved, to my knowledge anyway, they haven't approved a, a particular form for these liens. They, they have the contents uh, listed, and as a result, they just look much like a letter titled Notice of Federal Lien or something similar. It can vary a little bit, but uh, uh, it will have some sort of caption that would identify it as a lien typically. So in searching for these liens, search the same way you would as for a federal tax lien. Um, be sure to specify that a search of a federal, a federal tax lien search, if that's what's wanted and you want these brought into the scope of it, be sure to mention uh, when ordering it that uh, you want the ERISA and environmental liens because otherwise they can get overlooked because they, they are in some somewhat different forms. Um, and then when doing the search, make sure to use name variations. Again, the federal government doesn't have to uh, follow the UCC debtor name rules, which are very strict. Now I want to talk about agricultural liens. Uh, an agricultural lien is a statutory lien. It's defined, actually, in UCC Article 9 as an interest in farm products which occurs payment or performance of an obligation, uh, basically for uh, uh, those who supply goods or services uh, that are connected to a debtor's farming operation that help the debtor raise crops or, or livestock. Uh, there are many different types of liens, and the terminology varies widely from state to state. They can be called an adjuster's lien, or uh, you know, and there may be very specific liens. Um, and typically, the property subject to the lien will be the uh, farm products uh, that uh, that the 
claimant helped the uh, farmer raise. There's uh, many different examples of agricultural liens. It varies widely from state to state. Uh, one example that's very common is a landlord's lien. This covers unpaid rent for the use of agricultural land. It's different from uh, other types of landlord's liens that allow seizure of personal property. This is a non-possessory lien. Uh, a harvester's lien. Somebody comes in, picks the crops, and uh, helps farmer get them to market. Their, their uh, payment is uh, secured through a harvester's lien. Um, an in agricultural input or supplier lien, sometimes it's called adjusters liens, things like that. Um, these are for people that provide goods or services that enable the raising of crops or livestock, might include veterinarian fees, animal feed, um, other services and things like that. And there's uh, liens for farm labor to ensure that uh, those who help out around the farm on the promise of payment get paid. Um, so one very important thing to understand about agricultural liens, they are specifically within the scope of Article 9. To perfect an agricultural lien, the claimant has to file a UCC financing statement under Article 9, and it must comply with the debtor name rules and so forth for um, uh, sufficiency of the record. However, there's one big difference here. An agricultural lien is governed by the law of the state where the farm products are located. Perfection and priority is governed by the state where the farm products are located, not by the state where the debtor is located. So the filing location may be different. And let's take a situation where we have a farmer who lives right on the Minnesota-Iowa border. The farmer lives in Minnesota, but farms land both in Minnesota and in Iowa. In that case, when you're conducting a search, you would have to do a UCC search in Minnesota to find UCC security interests and agricultural liens covering the crops and livestock in Minnesota. But you would also have to do a search of the Iowa Secretary of State to find agricultural liens covering the crops and livestock that are actually located in Iowa. So uh, you know, beware of that. The governing law is different. As I said, perfection requires the filing of a UCC financing statement. However, there may be additional notice requirements that uh, the claimant has to uh, provide. Um, there have been some court cases on this, and typically they have to comply both with the agricultural lien law and with the UCC. Uh, when it comes to priority, in general, agricultural liens are subject to the same priority rules as a UCC security interest. The first to file or perfect gets uh, ahead in priority. Priority ranks from the earlier time of filing or perfection. However, Article 9 expressly states that if the statute that created the agricultural lien provides a different priority, then um, that priority is what applies. So in some cases, state agricultural lien laws will provide a super priority for those who provide um, goods or services to enable a farmer to harvest crops. And this actually makes sense because they're, in a sense, providing uh, the equivalent of a purchase money um, uh, input to help the farmer get these to market. Without their input, they, it, they simply wouldn't have been raised. And as a result, they get a super priority in some cases. But that's all determined by state law. So the search best practice for agricultural liens is conduct a UCC search in the state where the farm products that could potentially be subject to an agricultural lien are located. Uh, this is especially important when a, a farmer is conducting operations in multiple states. And that's not unusual uh, for those that uh, are located near a border. Finally, I want to uh, talk about some uh, specific other types of state statutory liens. There are a number of state statutory liens. In some states, there may be 40 or more different types of statutory liens that protect uh, various parties. For example, uh, you know, most states provide for an attorney's lien so that an attorney uh, gets paid. Um, there's mechanics liens, which um, are sometimes are called construction liens. Um, uh, sometimes uh, um, material and supplier liens, these are for the improvement of uh, real property. And those who provide these inputs have a lien on that real property because they added to the value of it. 
Uh, you have oil and gas liens. Uh, there's a tool and die lien in some states. Uh, uh, Michigan comes to mind. I think there's one in Pennsylvania as well. Maybe it's Ohio. But this protect, protects tool and die makers that uh, provide the tooling uh, primarily for the auto industry. And uh, so they give them some special protection. Um, there's a potato lien in Maine, a uh, fishing lien, aircraft lien for people that improve aircraft. And my uh, all-time favorite, the stray beast lien, which was a lien in favor of um, uh, you know, the victim of damages that was caused by a cow or something that got loose. It's not really an agricultural lien, but it, um, it protects those who are damaged by a stray animal. And uh, the, you know, they, the animal winds up being subject to the lien. These are all liens that are currently uh, out there under various state laws. Now, some of these liens are possessory. Um, and that this is common when uh, the lien involves repair work, like somebody brings their car into an auto mechanic, uh, the, uh, they fix the car, and they don't have to release it until they get paid. So it's a possessory lien. Although, sometimes these possessory liens can be converted into a non-possessory lien and retain the same uh, kind of a super priority by filing a UCC financing statement. Some states allow for that, but not all. Uh, and this makes sense because uh, if the uh, particular goods that are subject to this possessory lien are something that the debtor might need in order to generate the revenue to pay off the lien, um, it, it's really in everybody's benefit to uh, to have a way to, to convert that into non possessory into a non possessory lien. Uh, with a state statutory lien, oftentimes uh, the lien law will say uh, that the lien is perfected by filing a UCC financing statement. However, uh, in these types of situations, it isn't a lien within the scope of Article 9, unless it's an agricultural lien, and consequently um, it may not be subject to the Article 9 rules for sufficiency of the record. They may not have to get the debtor name exactly right and things like that. Um, for, for recording these in the real estate records, you know, some types of liens, like mechanics liens, um, sometimes get filed in the real estate records. Sometimes they're filed in the court records. They're treated more like a judgment than as, a, uh, as an encumbrance on real property. And uh, you know, state environmental liens are kind of that way, too. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an example of a state environmental lien. Uh, Illinois has one, many states do, for state cleanup costs of uh, pollution. Um, and they will, the states tend to give these, or at least some do, uh, they'll give them super priority over all prior existing liens. Um, it typically will only apply to the real property, but it depends on the state law. Uh, the filing process is probably very similar to uh, um, you know, any type of particular state law. So when it When it comes to uh, the search best practices for state environmental liens, you have to review the state environmental lien law before beginning search and search in the appropriate index. In fact, the best practice for all of these other state statutory liens is going to depend on state law. The starting point is to review the state statutes that might apply to the particular collateral. Uh, again, there, there are special protections in some states for certain types of uh, of property and certain types of uh, inputs to that property um, where the, the state has determined that somebody needs special protection in there. Um, so depending on the type of property involved in a transaction, it may be necessary to look for some of these other statutory liens. And that's going to require consulting the statute, then looking at the appropriate index, and searching name variations because, again, these things typically do not have to comply with the Article 9 requirements, even if they are filed in the Article 9 UCC index at the particular state or county. They may have uh, entirely different rules that govern these things, and they may be searched um, uh, in a way that won't pick up name variations. So you have to look for name variations. You have to be uh, proactive in doing that. Well, that's. Uh, that's the high-level overview of statutory liens. Again, um, many of these that arise under state law are very state-specific and require consultation with the law of the particular state. Um, at this point, 
Um, I'm going to put my contact information on the screen. If you ever have questions about statutory liens, UCC, or anything, you can always feel free to contact me. Uh, I deal with this stuff every day, and I'm happy to share any information I have. Um, but now I want to uh, go back to Anu for um, uh, Q&A. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Give everybody a moment to uh, co jot down your contact information, and then we'd like to um, ask one more question. So we will go ahead and open the Q&A session. Also, just as a reminder, you can download a copy of today's materials from the handouts box. If you'd like to see what other webinars CSC offers, click on the free education webinars link in the Join Us For More box. I'll go ahead and launch that now. So we have one question for you on the screen. Would you like a salesperson to contact you with more information? So if you'd like to um, make your selections now, one of us will give you a call after the webinar. So Paul, Adele wrote in, when requesting a lien search, it is in our best interest to specifically request an ERISA, an environmental lien search, or is the search automatically conducted by CSC? Um, when we're doing a tax lien search, we're looking for tax liens. Uh, we may report ERISA and, uh, and other liens as FYIs. So if you, if you specifically want these, I do recommend saying please include any, uh, any federal liens, not just uh, federal tax liens. Very good. And, and, and don't hesitate to discuss it with your customer service rep to explain. They're, they're, they're much more informed about the ordering process than I am, but they'll make sure you get what you're looking for. Okay, very good. Uh, just a reminder to everybody to send your questions in the Q&A. The um, raising hand option is disabled at this time. Francis wrote in, is there a point where the IRS is grossly in error regarding company or individual name? Um, the, the court decisions out there, and I haven't uh, done a lot of the court research on this, but um, there, there is a point where it crosses the line. Um, I, I just don't recall a case where it happened. Uh, yeah, the IRS has some fair, fairly broad latitude. For example, um, what, they, what they do typically is they will file the financing statement or the, uh, the tax lien and they'll name the debtor as ABC Company, comma, A Corporation. And if you search that with the UCC standard search logic, it, you know, it'll disregard in most states corporation at the end, but it won't disregard A. And um, as a result, a search of uh, ABC company is, is going to be compared, to, it's going to compare ABC after disregarding the, the noise words, it's going to compare ABC to the tax lien, uh, which after disregarding the noise words is ABC company A and they won't match and won't be reported. So the, the, uh, they are using a system that they are happy with, but doesn't mesh well with the, uh, with the UCC search logic. So it's always a good idea to, to ask for name variations, uh, use a search logic that provides name variations. Our self-service tool is a name variation search logic, and we do report similar names um, when conducting uh, in, you know, any type of tax lien search. Good deal. Shauna's asking, how do we know whether it is necessary to do a UCC search for AG liens in other states besides where the de debtor lives? Um, for, you mean judgment, I think they mean judgment liens? Um, well, um, it, it's typically going to be determined by where the debtor owns property. Um, that That's typically what's going to determine where to search for judgment liens is where there's property. See, it's, they're hard to find based on where the um, court case was brought because a plaintiff can bring a court case just about anywhere that has personal uh, jurisdiction over, a, over the defendant. But the defendant's real property doesn't move around, so typically these will get filed in counties where um, the debtor owns real property, and that's how to find the judgment lien as opposed to the judgment. Okay. Thank you. Marcy wrote in, do the CSC searchers automatically look under name variations for Fed liens or state liens? 
Um, yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll report name variations that, uh, uh, and I, I don't off the top of my head recall the exact criteria that we use on it, but uh, they will make you aware of name variations. Great. Lauren is asking, are there other federal liens besides those you cover that we need to worry about? Um, there's probably other federal liens. These are the only ones I ever typically come across that we're asked to search. Um, but uh, you know, the, the federal law is, uh, it, what is it, uh, like 175,000 pages now. It's, that might just be the regulations. But uh, federal law is pretty extensive, and I'm sure buried in there are various other liens. But again, um, they, the statutes do tend uh, on the federal level to direct the, um, the agency entitled to the lien to the federal tax code and file in compliance with that. So typically they're going to be in the same place as a federal tax lien. I haven't run into a case where they aren't. But it's not to say it couldn't be. Ron is asking, is an effective financing statement filed under the Food Security Act the same thing as an agri agricultural lien? No, it is not. A, um, the Food Security Act is a federal law um, to, is designed to protect the buyers of farm products. See, under Article 9, a buyer in ordinary course of business takes free of a security interest created by the seller um, even if it, even if the buyer is aware of the security interest, with one exception, and that is if they're if the uh, um, if, if the buyer is a buyer of farm products. Uh, Article nine uh, was drafted with the sense that uh, you know farmers uh, you know might uh, sell their crops not realizing they're subject to a lien and not pay the lien holder, so they had they had this little carve out in buyer of ordinary course, but buyers of farm products didn't want to risk buying subject to the lien, so they petitioned Congress. Congress came up with the Food Security Act. And an effective financing statement filed under the Food Security Act merely prevents a buyer from being a buyer in ordinary course. So uh, if the secured party doesn't file it, they still have to file a financing statement, whether they file an effective financing statement or not, because the financing statement perfects their security interest. The effective financing statement prevents a buyer from being a buyer in ordinary course and taking free of the security interest because the, the buyer can then search and identify the security interest and when they make payment for the farm products, they can pay both the lender and the, and the farmer. So it's not the same thing. It's not an agricultural lien. In fact, it's not a lien at all. All right, thank you. So that is all the time we have today. If we didn't get to your question, we will contact you with a response after the webinar. Thank you, Paul, again, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.